is Acts 16, verses 13 through 23. Acts 16, verses 13 through 23. I'll be reading from the Revised Standard Bible with a little Nikki Duncan Smith remix, if that's okay. Amen. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the river side, where we were told was a place of prayer. And we sat down and we preached to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple. She was the worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart so that she can heed what Paul was saying about God. And then she was baptized with her whole household. She besought us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And we obliged. We came to her house and we stayed. As we were going to the place of prayer again, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination all over her and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us and she was crying, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. And Paul got annoyed. Paul got annoyed and he turned and said to the spirit, I charge you in the name of Jesus to come out of her. And it came out of her that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope to gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and they dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they brought them in front of the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs which is not lawful for us, Romans, to accept or to practice. And so the crowd joined in and they started attacking them also. And the magistrates tore the garments off of them and gave them orders to, to get beaten with rods. And when they afflicted Paul and Silas with many blows, they threw him into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Charging the jailer to keep them safely. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his mighty word. Amen. 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 Pray with me as I offer this thought. Ain't I a woman too? When your midnight doesn't matter. Ain't I a woman too? When your midnight doesn't matter. God, step in, God. Remove me out of the way so that your people might hear a word that edifies them, God. God, that they might see the scriptures in a new light, God. Yeah, bless the Lord. That word. they might have a desire to cling closer to you and to understand their call. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 It is my office season, St. Paul. I just joined the cast after being gone for a few years. Like I was working this out. It is indeed my office season. And during this time, this time of reflection, we as a congregation get to look back over the vast history of our ancestors, specifically the experience here on this continent. Our ancestors, those Africans, they were confused and disillusioned and according to some narratives, they were embarrassed. They were embarrassed because they had descended from, from majesty in Africa to chattel bondage here in this hemisphere. Yes. Yeah whether they were dropped off in the islands of the Caribbean or whether they were nestled in the colonies, they were considered enslaved. And while you might have your favorite African or black person in black history that you like to study, who inspires you, I know some of y'all like Harriet Tubman. Some of y'all like Christmas Addis. Somebody likes Frederick Douglass. The only judge, or Benjamin Banneker, and for some of y'all, y'all just like Kunta Kinte and Kizzy. 
we all got an ancestor that we would swear by. And for me, that would be a woman named Sojourner Truth. She was a bad man, Jim, if you don't know anything about Sojourner. Sojourner was amazing. She was born in 1797. Her name was Isabella Bonfrey. But she changed her name to Sojourner Truth when God called her to preach the gospel and called her to preach the gospel not just on her plantation, but to move out into the world. And as she moved out into the world and preached the gospel all over the, the, the country at the time and all over New York in particular, she also spoke about the abolishment of slavery. She spoke about disarming slavery. But she also talked about women's rights in the early 1800s, well before Kamala and Hillary or even Shirley Chisholm thought about becoming the president. Way before the 60s when the women were out there burning their bras, God knows people need their bras, but they were burning them. Before Mom's baby wanted a man that was older than his birth date and declared that she gonna count her own money. Before all of that, before slavery had ended, she was out there fighting against sexism, racism, and classism. There's a famous, famous speech that she gave. It was called, Ain't I a Woman? And in this speech, this famous speech, she says, that man over there says that a woman needs to be helped into her carriage and lifted over ditches and have the best places for her everywhere. Well, nobody has ever lifted me into a carriage and nobody ever helped me over mud puddles or nobody's ever given me the best place. And ain't I a woman? Look at me. Look at my arm. I have plowed and I've planted and I've gathered the barns and no man can, can, can help me. And ain't I a woman? I can work just as much and eat just as much as any man. I can, I can do all of that. And I can also bear the lash. Ain't I a woman? I've born 13 women, 13 children from my womb. And I've seen them all sold off into slavery. And when I cried this mother's grief, no one heard me but Jesus. And ain't I a woman? Come on. And while she was talking about white women and, 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 and the comparison between her blackness and their whiteness, I like to take that racist mentality and apply also social class discrimination that came up out of slave culture. Yes, they treated white women a certain way. They treated them better because of their race. But you better believe that she had to ask, ain't I a woman? Because they still saw her downtrodden like a slave. While this white woman who was born free was seen as a free and therefore superior person. Yeah. And I a woman. And while we can look at this and we can pontificate all that we want about how bad it was back then, how, how people valued whiteness over blackness and white womanhood over black womanhood and black manhood is less than white manhood. While we can look at all of that, social class still comes up and comes to play. It comes up today. It came up in slavery. And I believe that even in this text, it is coming up. Now, you know, I like to look at the scriptures and I like to unpack them and, and break them apart into simple nuggets for you to carry them in your pocket so y'all can tell somebody later. But I also like to explode and blow up the way that you read the scriptures. Because it's important for us to grow in our interpretations and our applications of this word if we believe that it's the living word of God. Do y'all believe that, St. Paul? Do you believe that this is the living word of God? And if so... You can't be afraid to see the text in your eyes and see these characters in, the, in this Bible just like we see each other, like we see ourselves. So let us look at this text. There's a lot of things going on in this text. There's a few things going on. And, and though I didn't read earlier in chapter 16, what we know is that Paul gets a vision. Yeah. Paul gets a vision from a man telling him to go into Macedonia and preach the word of God. The man is crying out. He's saying, come to Macedonia and help us. In the Greek, the word is boateo. 
That is a word that means more than just help. It means to aid or to rescue. It means to liberate us. It is an urgent call of distress. He is saying here that they are desperately in need of a preacher to preach the gospel, to preach the true gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel that he preached that would, would set the captives free. What a wonderful gift it is for God to place you on assignment to liberate a community that you know is spiritually bound, emotionally bound, politically bound the most Certainly, physically bound yeah. as members of the historic and profoundly prophetic St. Paul Community Baptist Church. We understand that type of call. We understand that we are called to liberate people. We've been doing it for over 90 years. We get it. We understand. And so when we're looking at Paul, the preacher, we're looking at him as he's gathering his team of elders to, to go into Philippi. They, they wanted to go into Asia, but the Holy Spirit told them that they could not go, that they had to go to Europe. And Philippi is in Europe, and they're going there. And when they get there, they're going to the house of prayer for a city, and that's located on the riverside. So they're going to the riverside, to the house of prayer. And to their surprise, they see a group of women. The group of women waiting at the house of prayer for them waiting to hear about God. Now what is strange about this scenario is that in first century Jewish culture you can't have a house of God with only women there. In order for them to have some sort of worship there had to be ten men there to institute Torah. But there were no Jewish men in Philippi. Because if there were, the Bible would have told us that. Because what we do know is that the Bible mentions when men are in the house. I'm not hating, I'm educating, I'm not trying to divide, I'm trying to open your eyes. See, the truth of the matter is that less than 15% of the characters that are in the Bible are women. There are 93 women who actually speak in the Bible. And four, 49 of them are named. These women speak a total of 14,000 and 56 words collectively. Roughly 1.1% of total words in our holy book. And so it's strange, it's strange that Philippi, there are no men here to speak or to meet Philip, and Paul and Silas and Luke. It wasn't until they came here and ministered to the women that we hear about men of the faith. Mm -hmm. And while they're ministering to the women, they find one. Her name is Lydia. Lydia is one of those 93 women in the Bible that actually speaks. She is one of the 49 that actually has a name. She speaks only 14 words in, out of the Greek, 14,059 words that make up 1.1% of the Holy Book. But she does get identified as someone that speaks, and they recognize it. The writers, Luke, who is the writer, recognize it. And see, Lydia is different. She's unusual. She's different than all the women that they would have met in Jewish culture. First, she's European. Mm -hmm. She's a white woman. And despite what the Pope might tell you, or what Bill O'Reilly or Roseanne Barr might think, Santa Claus is white. But the Jews of the Bible were not. Amen. They were black and brown people just like us. And so Lydia would have been the first convert in Europe to come to God. Secondly, she's a businesswoman, running her own affairs, running her own household, and she's doing it without a man. We know that if there were a man, we would have heard about him. Amen? Amen. Amen. And thirdly, we understand that she's rich. And so she offers up her home. She invites them in to her home, and they come. And Paul and she connect. They connect because they're both Roman citizens. And I know that the Holy Spirit is working in there, but there's something about their social class that connects them to people. And not only does it connect them, but we read through the syntax and even the structure of this, this, this story that he likes that she became saved under him. Yeah. It's a positive thing. Their encounter, her salvation, her liberation is worthy of celebration, is victorious. 
Paul is proud that she was delivered on his watch. But then, in the very next story, we read about the slave girl. A slave girl who had many masters. Yes. Masters, according to my friend Nicole Love, because we do Bible discussions together. Masters who were gambling with her God-given gifts. Look what they did. They exploited her. The Bible tells us that they got money off of her gifts of divination. She was a fortune teller, and she, she could read people's future. And that's bad stuff, right? Not always. Right? But then, we just got finished reading about Joseph yeah, not in always. Genesis. Amen. 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 Who in Genesis 44 and 5 and Genesis 44 and 15 also had a gift of divination. That's the word they used. But we celebrate him. <laughs> we don't celebrate him. That's a different sermon for it. <laughs> anyway, we got a girl here who's being exploited. Mainly because of these skills. And when we look at the word that they use here for her as a slave girl, it is potasikin. And that's different. In the Greek, it doesn't just mean a slave girl. It means a prostitute. So she was enslaved to a system of prostitution in addition to them exploiting her systems of divination, her, her gifting of divination. They would, they, they would have used the same word that they used for Rhoda in Acts 12, but they didn't. This girl was trapped. Like many of the girls that we know today, like many of the girls, those girls in Africa, the girls, 270 girls from Shabbat, Nigeria, who was kidnapped, right? Like they were sold into slavery for a cup of Starbucks coffee. We don't got to look in Africa. We can talk about this guy, Jeff Epstein. I don't know if y'all seen him on the news, but this, this billionaire was just indicted for sex trafficking. Yes. The guy who in the 90s got all the girls with Donald Trump's parties. Yeah. White powerful men exploiting yeah. poor, defenseless children. We don't got to look to these white men either. We can just go around the Brownsville, right past Trey Whitfield, and we see the young ladies turning tricks as we pass them on our way to and from church. The girls are slaves and they don't have any choice. They're also being exploited. So we have this girl who has the power, to, the, the gifting to see someone else's future, but she doesn't have the power to liberate herself. That's somebody here today. Someone who, who, who has been blessed to see something in someone else who can help other people navigate their own future, see the light in someone else, benefit someone else before yourself. You see someone, you need somebody to come in and help set you free. Yeah. To help you, to show you the lights, male or female. You understand being able to see how to liberate others, but you are yourself bound by a stronghold that you can't alone break. Even in her bondage, this child in the text, she was able to see and articulate that Paul and them were sent from God yes. to set the people free and teach them about salvation. The scriptures say. That she said this out her mouth. And what did it do to Paul? It annoyed him. He was annoyed. It annoyed Paul because everywhere he went to preach, here she goes calling out. He's a servant of God. With the message from God, he will give us liberation. He will teach us about salvation. Even as her masters were still pimping her to tell someone else's future. Even as she belonged to several masters, because it don't just say masters, it says masters. Yes. She wasn't just one. She was constantly in jeopardy, sneaking out away from her masters to hear this man preach. She placed herself in danger every time just so she can hear him preach. And while she was bound, she was still bound with the spirit of divination, but she still saw Paul because she knew Paul had the answer to what ailed her. See me like you see Lydia. Ain't I a woman too? And Paul was annoyed. He was so annoyed that he cast his spirit to stop her from following him around. Here, take your blessing and go. Leave me alone. 
Get out of here. She was a slave. She was bound by a demonic spirit. But she still came to him. Because he had access to a Lord that she knew could set her free. Mm -hmm. And he, with an attitude, rebuked that spirit. My mind goes back to Jesus and the Canaanite woman and how he treated her. Yeah. How even she said the words of St. John the truth. Ain't I a woman? I keep hearing this with all these women. The women at the well, the, the Mary Magdalene, the woman accused of adultery. All the women that society shuns. But eventually Jesus heard them saying, ain't I a woman? It was a cry of dignity. Ain't I a woman? It was a cry. Even when it seems like you're in your particular midnight and no one understands it and no one thinks that it matters. You are in your midnight, the lowest season of your life, your darkest hour. Ain't I a woman? I'm sure that Lydia, Lydia, before she heard Paul, was, was searching for her own truth in her darkness. She might have been rich, but she still had her own midnight. Yeah. But you see, he was able to see value in her because of her status. And it was made sense to pull her out of her midnight. She was easy sell. She probably had doe eyes and was cute. She probably was educated. She probably looked the part of a Christian. She, she probably was upright and holy. I'm sure she was upright and holy. A real woman's woman. But this child, this child, I'm sure she was not that dignified. I mean, they didn't even dignify her with a name, this child. Slave girl, possibly trafficking, passed from man to man, master to master, exploited, needing to be set free. And Paul looked at her and was annoyed. He was annoyed by how low down and ratchet she was. Mm. Annoyed because she probably was loud and ignorant. She probably was unkept. She probably had some other men on her breath. She had to use the gifts that she had to make money. She had to use whatever she could cough up to get by. And Paul saw that and was annoyed. He didn't free her from a from the spirit with a space of from a space of love or ministry. He freed her from a space of dismissiveness and uppityness. Mm. I'm better than you. You ain't hearing her say, I ain't, ain't I a woman? Doesn't my midnight matter just as much as Lydia's? He couldn't hear that. He was dumb to the call over his life, just like many of the disciples were. When they blasted the women, the woman with the issue of blood, when she came to touch Jesus, the woman with the seven demons, the woman with the sick daughter. Can you imagine what this precious pearl felt like when she saw how he looked at Lydia with respect, but then looked at her with disgust? Why would you be so mean, Paul? Why are you so mean, man of God? Preacher, man. And I wanted to get mad at Paul. I mean, I am mad at Paul. <laughs> Who is he to be annoyed at one of God's children? Somebody that he was called to rescue. You all know I get pretty mad at a lot of characters in the Bible. But then I had to think. Have I been Paul? Have I look down on someone because they didn't meet the standard of what a Christian is supposed to be. That's good. Then I look at them with their stain on their shirt. Last night's pint of whatever they were sipping on, on their breath. Yeah. I look down on them. Am I not seeing another woman's honor or her same rights to salvation or grace to God? Am I judging them or her? Because they ain't as educated as I am. They ain't tithing in the church. Their shoes are ran over. Their jeans are too tight. They might talk a little loud. They, they're not a mini version of me. Because let's face it, we like to worship and minister to people who look like us, who act like us, and who think like us. That's good. But then I can hear them say, in the words of Sir Journey Truth, ain't I a woman? And I check myself. Or I see them with the signs like the brothers from the civil rights movement. Ain't I a man? Even as they go out looking for jobs and the world is smacking them in their face. Ain't I a man? And I check myself. Dare 
midnight experiences are just as important as mine. The answer will be yes, I have been this person. And if you are honest, if you're honest, you know somebody in ministry who also is that type of person. It might not be a young girl, but it might be one of the Chinooza Bakari boys that you got your nose turned up to. It might not even be the CB boys. It might be one of the boys who parents can't afford for them to be in CB and you're looking down on them. We all know people who have acted just like Paul. We've been annoyed when God has called us to be compassionate yes. to people we don't like. We've been annoyed when God has called us to have mercy on people we think don't deserve it. Annoyed when God has given us the privilege to love up on his people when we're on our high horses. Yet their midnights are just as important as ours. Yes. I got three points, other Wendy, and then I'm out. <coughs> Sorry, I'm taking a little longer than I, I should. <laughs> but point one, don't forget your call. Don't forget your call. When the man in the vision came to Paul and told him to come to Europe, he was called to spread the word to those who were in need. He was called with the urgency to, to, to come to people who would be open to hear about Jesus Christ. Remember, Paul was the one that wanted to include the Gentiles, even when the disciples were like, this table is for the little children. We ain't going to give our food to the little dogs. The disciples, it was a part of that. But we see here, for a moment, Though Paul does have a genuine spirit, I don't think that Paul is an evil man. But for a moment, he forgot the core part of his call. See, Lydia was easy to sell, like I said. She was upright. She was easy for him to talk to. But the slave girl was countercultural. See, he was Roman. He was Jewish, but he also was Roman. And so slaves were beasts of burdens. He was easy to dismiss her. She was beneath him. So she got, he got annoyed letting his lower self prevail. He, 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 he forgot about his higher self that God had called him to work out of when he decided to follow our Lord. Yes, yes. When he got locked up, he was in there singing and he was praising God. And then all of a sudden the jail started to shake and there was an earthquake and, 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 and every, everybody was free. Yes, it ended out great. But I like to think in my Holy Ghost imagination that while he was singing and praying, he was also repenting for how he forgot that the Lydia's are important, but so are the slave girls. My question to you, St. Paul, have you forgotten your call? Are the Lydia's more important to you than the slave girls? Are you more comfortable sitting next to somebody that's like you or somebody that you brought to church or the person that looks the part than extend yourself to the new member? When we do the welcome address, do you just sit there with your face on a, or, or do you get up and pass the peace of Christ without somebody telling you to do it? Do you, do you meet God with the connection, uh, the thinking that I'm going to see God and the sister next to me and get up and hug a member who might not have had a hug all day? We all need hugs. Right. Yeah. You might have forgotten your call. But maybe you didn't. Maybe you just don't know what the call is. All right. Could the call be this? Love one another. That's John 13, 34, 35. Learn, love, serve one another. Galatians 5 and 13. Be kind to one another. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 15. Have fellowship one another. One, first John 1 and 7, offer hospitality to one another. First Peter 4 and 9, confess your shortcomings and pray for one another. James 5 and 16, follow, follow and carry one's burden. Galatians 6 and 2, encourage one another. First Thessalonians 4 and 18, you can't forget the call if you don't know it from the beginning. Learn your call and don't forget it. Point two, don't forget that the Ground at the cross is love. It is even. God has no respect for person. Paul had a little bit of clout, had a little bit of money, a little bit of prestige, a little bit of 
paper. Before he got down with the Jesus stuff, he was balling. Y'all know what balling means, right? He had dual citizenship. His, his, his educational attainments were vast. And, and he always used athletic imagery, which showed that he had been exposed to the Colosseum. And everybody was not exposed to the Colosseum. So we know that he had a little bit of status. Scholars would offer that, that this was indicative of his exposure to the aristocracy, which is why he and Lydia kicked it like that. But while the text usually celebrates Paul and his team, I'd like to submit that in this ministry model, he forgets that something that we all must never do. That even as we ascribe to the hierarchy that is set up in this church, we, we ascribe that, that there's pastor and then the elders and then the ministers and the council of white rules, and we ascribe to that type of hierarchy. In the church, there really is level ground. There are no big eyes and little you. We all got to see the maker at our own time and be judged against our own standard. Moreover, despite how saved you think you are, you don't have a god darn idea of God's measurement standard. You don't know how God is going to measure you. Amen. Miss Jan, <laughs> tell me if it's true. <laughs> In Deuteronomy, it says God is the God of all gods. He's the greatest God, and he shows no partiality. Is that true, Ms. Jan? That's true. Ephesians says God destroys all social barriers, making us all one. Genesis says that we are all made in the image and the likeness of God. Proverbs 22 and 2 says that the rich man and the poor man have this one thing in common. The Lord is the maker of us all. Romans 2 and 11 says that God shows no favoritism. And so that is just as important as knowing your call. Understanding that the people that you serve, you ain't better than them. Y'all all got to put your pants on one leg at a time. I, I censor myself sometimes. Things be getting ready to fall out of my mouth, but I know my mother wouldn't be happy about it. We all have our own midnights. And your midnight is not more important than theirs. It might not look the same, but that's because you're using your own measuring stick and not God's measuring stick. The ground at the cross is leveled. The table where God sets his banquet of salvation invites us all to come there. So, so we can't forget our call. We can't forget the value that is in each and every one of us that we are called to serve. And that leads me to my last point. Point three. You can't forget your midnight. Well, Don't forget your midnight. Remember how God pulled you from your darkest moment. Remember how God saw you in your sin, yes. in your mire, and said, I love him. I love her. He is mine. Oh, she belongs Amherst. to me. I love to sit and listen to Elder Carter talk about his days back in Harlem, mm -hmm. how he used to run the streets. I love to hear him impart that type of wisdom. Not from a place of he's better than me or he's been dead, that's been that, that old and I love to hear him minister because I know he can understand some of the trials and the struggles that I'm going through, which is why that ministry, Wounded Healers, is so important because that's where you get to kind of wrestle and be free. And someone that understands your struggle won't judge you because they understand the midnights. I love to see Elder Boy or to listen to Reverend Elder Dexter talk about back in the day and share their stories. You can look in their faces and see midnights and strip it on their face. It's in their walk. It's how they talk. It's, it's Miss Jan. That's good. I know you got a midnight. <laughs> Two or three of them. in your pocket right now. I know. <laughs> Thank you to God that he is omnipresent and that he is omnipotent and that he has seen us while we were yet sinners and offered us some grace. Yes. He's heard our cries and did not cast our spiritual vices aside, but was not annoyed with our cries, but he saw us and with love and compassion still wanted us to be his just as much as we wanted to belong to him. 
Before we understood the cause on our lives, Jesus was standing there with open arms before we, he, we decided to even become worthy enough for Jesus. Jesus was there with his arms open and we didn't have to say ain't I a woman or ain't I a man because he knew us from the moment that we was knit in our mother's womb. Jesus knew us. He loved us. In my mind, I go back to Sojourner. And I think about her life. And I think about how she was sold from plantation to plantation. How she was treated cruelly and she was mistreated and beaten. And how the master sold so many of her children. Most of them. She had no teen and they sold most. I know that that had to be a midnight. Yes. In her life. But then God called her. And when God called her, she was affirmed. And they say that one day, when her master didn't set her free in 1827, when all of the New Yorkers were supposed to be free, and he didn't free her, <laughs> she got up and left. She got free from her personal midnight. She got free from slavery. She stepped up, and later on, she informed her master, I didn't run away in the dark. I walked away by the daylight. God will give you a daylight. That's good. Your life matters to God. So much that he will give you the courage to walk through your darkest hour and not hide in the mask of the moon, but walk in the showering sunlight. He, he will have you walking straight ahead, defying all that the world is said to, to entrap you and to enslave you and to put you in bondage. He will get you free. Yes. And yeah, I'm mad at Paul. But I can't get mad at Paul without getting mad at myself. And some of you know what I'm talking about. Every time that, that you don't share your daylight with someone else that you know is stuck in midnight, every time when you don't emulate the welcoming forms of Christ, the Christ that we say that we are modeled after, every time, believe it or not, you invite another midnight to come into your life. See, it's not just one midnight. There's always another midnight coming. And while you can help shine light on someone's midnight, Someone else can shine light on yours. If it's not today, it might be tomorrow. But your midnight moment is coming again. You have the opportunity to reflect on the next time that it happened. And while you are there in your midnight, you can rest assured that God is still watching. You can rest assured that God is going to send somebody to liberate you. See, Paul did liberate him. No matter what his intention was, God's way was still getting done. He did. See, God can bless your mess. God can hit a straight lick with a crooked stick. God is always in control, even when we don't have the right posture. God can look past the preacher's shortcoming. Yeah. Still bring you out of your midnights. Because my loves, your midnights matter to God. Yes, amen. Amen.